I'm Kier from In Defense Of, a podcast member of the Gunna Geek Network, just like the one you're listening to now. The opinions expressed are those of each individual. Check out all the other podcasts at GunnaGeekNetwork.com and get ready, because geekiness begins in three, two, one. This is it. The part of your week where you get to put your headphones on, relax, and listen to a bunch of geeks geek out about geeky things. They're passionate. Did you know Magic Mike XXL is actually on the top 25 list of this year's best movie? They're witty. He loves him some Katy Perry because she kissed a girl and she liked it. They're crazy. I like Nickelback personally, but, you know, I'm the fuddy-duddy who likes episode one. And sometimes I leave you wondering, what the f***? I'm pretty sure that here uh, we were starting the hashtag movement, bring back Slave Feral. Welcome to the GunnaGeek.com podcast. Hello and welcome to episode 138 of the official GunnaGeek.com podcast. My name is Stephen John Drew and with me today is my homies. His name or one of them begins with Chris Farrell. Hello, people. We also have with us the one that keeps us in check. He keeps us in line and he keeps us always, always pioneering the Stargate. His name is Stargate Pioneer. You got to love to be the pioneer of Stargates because it just means you're, you know, out front of everybody. You're the you're the one. You are the pioneer. There's nobody else. It's just you. You if you're part of a network that means that Everybody is just not there, and it's just you. Yep. That's something, Holy moly, something, that made a lot of sense. I was a lot say, of sense was made right there. Something <laughs> words or something something there with words. And we also <laughs> have, have the Did one and only J.S. Your speeches? That sounds like the, your speeches were written by the same guy who used to write speeches for Bush. Oh. No, 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 not Bush. <laughs> Quail. Bush actually knew how to talk. Quail, on the other hand, yeah. Why did you guys have a bird running your country? No, no, no. Quail wasn't running the country. Quail was vice president. Bush was president. Oh, he I, was the deputy. I got it. I thought it was a politician that I didn't know that was actually named Quail. But the reason I didn't know that was because I don't care about your politics. And I don't care about yours. And we're even. That's true. And actually, I do care about your politics because you guys will be the end of the world. Most likely. We have enough <laughs> nuclear weapons to blow up the world like, I don't know, 5,670 times over. It's okay. There'll be a, there'll be a wall separating us and, and the world. So good. Yeah, uh, and walls work so well to keep out radiation fallout, right? All yeah. Right. yeah. That's good. That's good. We're good. So, how's your guys' this weeks going? Keep in mind the last part on the list that we've got going on over there. So don't talk about the C2E2s. What are you talking about? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Trying to get some sleep. <laughs> what, what is this sleep you speak of? I, I don't have, know. I have never heard of sleep. It, it, it is a myth, apparently. Well, the reason you haven't heard of sleep is because you tore down your whole rig and tore it back up. <laughs> That's true. And it is still a, a, an S show as we speak. So let's just go ahead and slide into the news. Shall we do that? Electric slide? Sure, why not? Or snow sliding. Yep. So it happened. That's right. The iPhone SE. It's a thing. I got one right here. I got one. It's right here. What is the iPhone SE, you ask? Well, the good news for you is I'm about to tell you. The iPhone SD is essentially an iPhone 5S with the guts of an iPhone 6S. So there you go. That's what you do. You take a little bit from Ma and a little bit from Pa. You make the phones have a little intercourse, and that's what happens. That's how you get yourself an iPhone SE. And you give them a little bit of jello. <laughs> 
Yeah, so if you weren't familiar with it, this is the long rumored small form factor phone that we talked about last week. Uh, Apple did decide, yes, they, they, there is a market for it. So it, it li literally is pretty much what I said. It is the size of an iPhone 5S and the very, very similar shell. Uh, I think a little bit more beveled edges and then the guts of an iPhone 6S. It's not plastic like the 5C. Yes. The, si the size actually pretty is nice. the exact same size. If you take a mm -hmm. look at the millimeters for the 5, 5S and for the SE, it's the same exact fit form. So your cases, your old cases for your 5s or your 5S will work on the SE. Yes, and the thing is, it's actually the same screen as well, uh, same screen. So you're not getting the tusher, the pressure touch screen that the 6S offers you, but who really cares, right? Does anyone actually use that force touch ability? The force touch. No, um, the, here's the thing that I actually find most fascinating about this. And, and I'm actually, I'm not an Apple user, but I'm really excited about this. It's the price point. It's like $399 for a 400 bucks for... for for a 16 gigabyte, which will mean nothing because you have all that great quality video no, that you can take. I want to relate it here, though. The original, like the 5S 16 gig price point was $599 when it launched right. only a couple years ago. This is mind blowing that there is a, a no contract phone price, an iPhone, a modern technology iPhone for three ninety nine outright, it is it that's Android territory, and I I think that it is it is pretty crazy, especially when you consider the fact that this phone here, crappier, but this phone here recently went for five ninety nine brand new. Well, I mean, the whole reason they've got to do that is because you're starting to see the Nexus line encroach on some of the lower cost margins. Not as much with the current line, but think of the original Nexus ones. You're also seeing like Xiaomi and um, crap, Huawei, two of Chinese companies that are starting to put out high quality Android phones that you can start getting them shipped to the United States. It's like 200 bucks for one, and it's almost as good as your current flagship phones you have here. So the price point is dropping. Now, you're not seeing that with the big ones like HTC and Samsung, but if you start buying from outside the main companies in the U.S., your prices are much cheaper now. Yeah. That S7 Edge is $799 in Canada with a contract. Yeah, How that nice is, is ridiculous. That? Yeah. yeah it's I would neat. say that you <clears throat> wouldn't want the 16 gigabyte version because with, like I said, the HD quality video and the motion pictures that you take, that thing's gonna fill up real fast. So you're gonna want to go up to the 499 version, which is 64 gigabytes. And the OS takes about eight to 10 gigs of that storage, I bet too. Yeah, I don't know. I think that it's pretty cool myself personally, but um, we'll see, we'll see what, ha what happens. I just think that it's, um, I think that it's a really good price point for Apple and I'm pretty damn impressed. It's a nice design. I really like the um, the iPhone 5 design. It was nice. It was sleek. The aluminum was nice. I mean, the iPhone 6 is nice too, but it feels like it can fall easily out of your hand. It doesn't grip as well. I, I like this uh, this design. So we talked about it before. I've been using this 5S. I actually had to use it last weekend because my phone was falling apart, as Chris can attest to. It wasn't just me. It, the I'm phone not allowed was to actually, talk about this last weekend right now. Yeah, right, right. But the, I'm not talking about the weekend in general. I'm just talking about the phone. The phone was possessed. And so I brought this 5S along with me just as a standby. And I, I was using it a little bit for Google Hangouts and stuff when I was in Wi-Fi. And the the typing, the buttons, it's so small. I, I can't go back. I need the big screen. Right. And I think that's going to be a problem for a lot of people. Well, yes. I don't think this this phone really caters to somebody who had who who has the six plus or or an Nexus six or six P or a Samsung Mega. This phone is this phone is for I believe probably um, older people. I, I would say, or an older crowd, or 
Uh, a male or female crowded head that does not care about their phone, but just wants it, something that looks good. It's also intended for emerging markets. I saw a lot of write-ups saying that the India market and things like that, where they need to get the phone to a lower price point to appeal to people, and they are not as caring about large-sized phones in like India and China and things like that. The four-inch size screen or whatnot, that's ideal in that part of the world. People aren't wanting like a six-inch screen there, so that's part of what they're doing or a part of the assumption is Apple's gone to this price point to make a greater, excuse me, a greater appeal outside of North America. But I tend to agree with uh, Suncast. I think it's just a pure money grab. I well, I, I do too, um, because it is geared towards the people who will not go up. Now, this is where I think it, it, it varies from a traditional Apple money grab, because I think that this is actually catered to a different market. It's not they're just going and they're they're making it so your camera does a, a GIF that that's a money grab. This has an, an uh, a specific purpose to actually appeal to a different consumer. Well, one thing to keep in mind is when this comes out and is deemed a failure monetarily because it doesn't get the sales that they want it to because let's face it the north american market is flooded with six and successes not to mention the s plus and the six plus that there isn't a lot of market for this phone in the united states in canada at this point in time you're right about worldwide sales but not here locally so i'm wondering if they're going to get panned like oh don't ever do that again you know nobody wants that phone you know, I, I'm going to have to disagree with you. I, I think this is going to be a phone that's going to sell very, very well because there's a lot of people who don't want to pay an upfront fee. They want their phone to be zero dollars when they sign up. And I think this phone is going to be at that price point, maybe not right away, but it's not going to take very long. Somebody's going to um, offer a plan. The, you'll get a new iPhone it'll, and they'll, they'll market it as the new iPhone and, and, and they'll sell it for zero dollars if you sign a two or three year contract. I don't know how what the contracts are in the States now, but in Canada, they'll probably subsidize the phone to zero dollars or it'll be like 19 bucks or something. So what's really kind of interesting here is that we, we touched on it. The main, the main iPhone SE is 16 gigabytes, the, the entry level one. That's kind of ridiculous. You've kind of seen the Android world go away from that, where 32 gigabytes is the entry-level phone because it leaves you space to actually do things. That's what really surprises me and kind of frustrates me at the same time is that the entry-level iPhone is still 16 gigs, and then they skip 32 gigs, and you go straight to 64. If you're going to do that, just go straight to 32. Make it so I've actually got some space. I know the argument is, well, you can use iCloud to supplement things. Well, no, you can't if you only get two gigs of data a month. Um, I agree. 16 is too small. I use a phone that is 16, but I, I have to disagree with your Android going away. Yes, some of the manufacturers are, but I believe the Moto X still starts at 16. Look at the current crop of Android phones coming out. The HTC, um, the new version of the one, this Galaxy S6 and 7, both came out as 32 gig as their lowest entry. Yeah. In fact, the most recent few HTC phones have been that way. But see, this is this is where the money grab for Apple, in my opinion, comes because that's true. 32 is that sweet spot right now. So what do they offer? A 16 and a 64. Uh, it, it's smart on their part from a marketing perspective because they know that they can get people up to that 64. That's my thoughts on it. I, I don't I mean, I don't think like I'll say it's slimy, but it's smart. Yeah, on I mean, parts. how much does it cost them to put in 32 gigs versus 16 gigs? How much of a difference is that in the margins? I wonder. I don't right. have the math for but that. This has been the problem with Apple for God knows how long is the fact that they have well, no, always no. charged a premium for their damn storage. Let's be fair. It's been a problem with all of these cell phone manufacturers is that well, no, the next step up is always $100 more unless you have expandable memory like an right. SD card slot and things like that. That they was, took they took that out of the Samsung phones, but they put, they it, back. put it back in the seven. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. yeah, people were complaining too much. Yeah, it's it's definitely an interesting time for for uh, smartphones. However, um, I I am actually really really I'll, I'll be honest, not an Apple user, but happy with this price point. I think that this is a good price point, even if it is a smaller phone. I think that this is this actually makes apple a modern apple let me specify that a modern technology apple product reachable to a, a much 
bigger market as far as people who aren't going to shell out that type of cash for a phone. So I'm okay with it. But if you want to save cash, uh, SP, how might you save cash if you are in the space business? Well, this is uh, interesting. It was an article that came out last week and we had been talking about it because JS kept on asking, well, how much is this going to save? And of course, what we're talking about here is SpaceX and the reusable first stage rocket on their Falcon 9 normal lift body. They're actually working on a heavy lift body that will debut in November this year. At least that's the schedule right now. However, in the same press announcement that they came out and said that the Falcon Heavy is due out later this year, they said, hey, look, this is actually how much it's going to save. Now, we talked about it before. I dug up information that a launch of a Falcon 9 is about $60 million. This is the reusable first stage that is supposed to come back down on the barge or back to the pad or whatever. If you reuse the first stage, you're going to save about 30% of the launch cost right now. Ultimately, they want to get it higher, but right now they're looking at 30% savings. So a $60 million launch would cost $40 million instead. So that's pretty good if you ask me. Yeah, it's good savings. I like getting extra money back. Mm -hmm. Especially nowadays where we're like losing funding left and right. Saving money is good. It is. Right. So it's basically the tax return of the space business. Is that right? Probably. I don't even know if these things are taxed or not. That would be interesting to, to learn. Hey, that's a good question for our financial nerf center. So if Mr. Neil is around, uh, I'd like to know about the taxing of the uh, American space vehicle. Well, lift. you're in luck because he is actually. No, he's not actually right here, but that would have just been, been amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been awesome. So th the other thing to talk about is that they are working, SpaceX is working on a very aggressive launch schedule. We talked last time about their competition over in Blue Origin and how they had not had as many launches out there. And they have been really suffering on uh, quality control checks in order to get as many launches out as they can on SpaceX. And... They are looking at 18 launches this year. That's another 16 total launches of the Falcon 9, including wow. the Falcon Heavy in November. That's great. That is more than one a month. That is a very, very aggressive schedule. They obviously have the customers to do it. They're not like just launching rockets just because they want to launch rockets. <laughs> They're trying to get them up there and make some money, but that is pretty cool. Now, one of the risk points of it, the, the risk avoidance parts, is that they have stabilized the configuration. So what the configuration is now is what it's going to be for quite a while. So whatever, whenever you can stabilize the design, it is going to be able to be mass produced a little bit easier. So they might actually pull this off. We'll see. So right now in March, mid-March, they're saying they're going to do 16 more launches. So we'll see. If that happens, Does, is SpaceX the designers and the builders? They actually build the rockets, or do they subcontract or outsource? No, they SpaceX don't? actually it actually builds the rockets. They don't build the satellites. That's the payload. No, but no, yes, no, I get they, that. They, they actually they build. build the rockets. Yeah, so Lockheed builds their lo rockets. Blue Origins builds their rockets. It's a if you've never seen it in person, I highly encourage you to go find one of these companies like Boeing or Lockheed or SpaceX or Blue Origin and actually go into their manufacturing facility. You won't actually be able to touch any of the hardware that's being manufactured because they like to keep it clean, you know, clean room or whatever. So you don't screw it up or anything. But it is an awesome thing to see. That's cool. Very, very cool. Um, I, I actually thought it would be higher than 30 percent. I'm sorry. Thirty percent's a lot, man. It is. It is. But I thought. Yeah, that's I huge. Thought, I think of, that think of it like this. Think of it like this. You ain't going on vacation to the states this year because the exchange rate is at thirty-two percent. Shut up with your analogies. That makes so much sense. <laughs> oh wow! Backed up by JS, man. Fist bump, oh, man. buddy. Thank you. Uh, I'm not saying that I wasn't an idiot to think that it was more. I was just saying that I think that it was more, or I thought it was more. So yeah. It would be more if they could reuse the second stage, but it's just not possible. It's just going to be I, a first stage reusable. And I mean, it could, it could, they could streamline the hell out of it. That's the whole point of this, of this 
project, I guess. So who who says they won't they won't make a better process or save even save more money? Right. Or build on this platform to to find a new new way of saving. It's 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 good, man. Thirty percent's a lot. Think of it like this. Mm-hmm. You launch three of them and you've almost built a new one for free. That's that's a really good way to, to think about it, JS. And and buy three, I like get that. one free. <laughs> Not exactly, but uh, yeah, we get the math. Now, here's the question, though. Do we think that we're going to get 30% more PlayStation 4? What do you think about that, Chris? Oh, I see what you did there. So last week was the gamers was the game developers conference, and there's some rumors coming out of there about Sony's approach for what they want to do with the PS4. What that rumor is, is that Sony's starting to brief some developers on an all new PS4 with increased graphics capabilities. They've been referring it to as the, excuse me, referring to it as the PS 4.5, and the rumor says it will sport a more powerful GPU than the current console. By that, it means they'll allow you to play games at full 4K resolution, whereas the current PS4 will only allow you to view videos and pictures at 4K. So, that could help there. It is rumored it will also include these enhancements to better support the upcoming PlayStation VR. Which is, their, which is the new VR goggles and set that is coming for PS4, very similar to Oculus Rift, HTC Vive, and things like that. Now, here's a caveat. All of the sources set team seem to indicate there, these are all exploratory conversations. Sony said nothing specific at this point. They're just floating the idea of putting out this enhanced PS4.5. And before we all go, oh, Sony, you sons of guns, why are you trying to do this to us? Bear in mind also, Phil Spencer, the head of the Xbox division at Microsoft, (laughs) has also floated that same idea out there for the Xbox One before he talked it back and realized that fans were not very happy to hear that. So I gotta ask you guys, what do you think about incremental hardware upgrades to your consoles? Good idea, bad idea. I, I so here's the thing about it. I think that um, it. I think we've got away with it for so long. With not sorry, we've gotten away so long without having it. But on the other hand, I do. I do like the idea of getting some longevity out of the the current um, gen if it offers more features. And we've seen this before with. What was it? PlayStation 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 2, right? PlayStation 2, they didn't upgrade. PlayStation 3 did that too. Did they? No, I don't think they upgraded. They reduced the size. So they reduced the size. Yeah, the hardware remained the same and the... It wasn't the same hardware. It was the same hardware. They just reduced the chassis size. Oh, that's all they did? Are you sure? I think think the the hardware is not exactly the same hardware. They made some changes. For example, there's no actual hardware switch on the back to turn it off. That's just an example. There's more differences between the two. But, but the hardware, guts were basically the different. same. Yeah, yeah, but, but the it, guts were the same. They're computers now. They're computers now. I understand Look, that. Consoles have become computers now. Like computers, you upgrade the video card. But so, every okay, so here's years. the problem. I'm consumer X. I bought my console. Now, two years later, I'm being told, hey, if you want to keep playing your games, you've got to buy a new version of the Xbox One. Or you've oh, got that's to not buy- what they're telling you. That's not what they're telling you. They're telling you if you want to play the game at 4K, you got to buy a new one. But you okay, don't it's want a slippery to slope, though. It's a slippery slope. Let me take you back in time. Let's go back to the uh, N64. All right, let's, let's make a difference. Let's let's call it the Wii UX 26 215. Let's take oh, out a new I console every two years. I actually have a legitimate years. argument I can make here if you want to listen for a second. <laughs> no, I don't want to listen to it. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> listens on the guttergeek.com podcast. That is not a thing that we do here. <laughs> so if, if you guys remember the N64, they put out their little expansion module you could get that would give you greater graphics processing power and things like that. Now, it was optional. You could get it and you'd get better graphics for the Rogue Squadron games and things like that. And then you waited a year. And if you wanted to play like the new Zelda game, you had to get the expansion module and play it. Now... That's less of an ass whip, basically, because you're buying an expansion module you can clip in your current hardware. If they do something like that, maybe that's okay. But if you have to buy completely new hardware to play the top of the line new Xbox One game, and it's set up so you can't play it on the old hardware, that's a problem. People don't buy consoles in the thought, I'm going to have to buy a new one in two years. They buy them in the thought, I'm going to have to buy a new one in four to five years at this point in time. All right, so I recently bought an Xbox One console for over the holiday period, and I got suckered in and I bought the Xbox Halo special edition version, and I had to make a choice. I could either get that version, which was at the one terabyte 
uh, level, or I could get the elite version, which had an SSD or at least an assisted SSD drive, a one terabyte drive in there. And I chose to go with the Halo version because I'm a sucker for Halo stuff on Xbox, valid, at least. Valid point. So, so there's the hard drive incremental increases that have been going on, and there will be graphic cards that will have to get updated. Hey, look at the 360. The graphics card that was in it, it, in performance, it was the same, but it was a different graphics card than when the... 360 first came out because they stopped manufacturing them. So they Correct. had to pick another manufacturer. So the specs are the same, but the hardware was slightly different. I think we're going to see more and more of that. Take a look at, you know, Chris, you and I bought very similar computers, very close together. Mm -hmm. I'm now two, I'm almost two years out. I am now looking at getting another one because the performance for what we're doing in video is now not good enough. So I want to buy a new computer with a slightly faster processor, a better graphics card, and more memory in it, and, uh, and an SSD for less than I bought my computer two years ago. It, the game consoles are going to be the same way. So every two to three years, you're going to be in a situation where you're not going to have the latest hardware. Now, I will agree that if you can't play the same games that are in the generation of the console, you're screwed. I mean, that's a bad thing. That's my biggest concern, because we saw it happen with the N64, for instance, is that, hey, if you want to play this, you can't. And that is the promise they make with these consoles, is you'll be able to play all of these games that come out for this console, and if that stops being the case, they either need to make it so I can easily upgrade my Xbox myself, which I doubt is going to be the case, or they need to make some kind of trade-in program that doesn't just ream me for the fact that I was an early adopter because that's how you lose customers on both the Sony and the Microsoft side is if you screw me over because I was an early adopter and I can't play stuff, I'm going to be like the hell with you. I'm staying on my cons on my PC gaming from now on. Early adopters always get screwed. Yeah, they always get, they have always, that's well, true, but this is a whole new level of being screwed. I, I, I disagree, but I, I mean, this has happened forever. It's always been happening. It's, it's, it's technology increases so fast. So what do you prefer them to take out a PS5? You know how peeved off people are going to be about that? Same, just as peeved off more. as making a PS4.5 yeah. that basically yeah. means I can't play the current games. I, I mean, don't know, though, that I think you're making. Here's my big problem with, with the rant right now is that you're making a big assumption that that's the way it's going to go. I think that more. Caveat, I said it could go that way. That was my concern. I know, but you're also ranting about it. It's like ranting about a, a trailer for a movie that's not out yet. But I, I think that we would never do that on the Gonna Geek podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Batman versus Superman. Exactly. So I, I think though, I agree. If they make it so that playability it becomes a problem, where yes, you cannot get the latest games. Okay, that's a bad idea. However, how about this idea where? new game comes out and you can only play at a certain quality and you for early adopters have to get the crappy 480p version, right? You know, it wouldn't actually be that, but you know what I mean? Like, I think you're probably more likely to see the scenario of um, computer gaming where if I have myself uh, the minimum requirements, I'm not going to get the same experience that JS gets having a badass machine. And that that would be OK with me, because then you're still getting the game to both avenues. It's just you got to have the latest and greatest to get the latest and greatest. And I could live with that. I mean, it, I understand it sucks. I mean, it's the same dilemma back like 10 years, seven years ago or eight years ago. I don't remember when the first original iPhone came out. And then one year later, the new iPhone came out and it was amazingly better. And then everybody flipped out because they couldn't get a new iPhone because they were on a contract for three years. Remember those days when people were freaking out and freaking out a lot? Like people were really pissed off. They could not get the new iPhone. No, you, you can't. Just, it's just, it's normal. You bought, you wanted the iPhone when it came out. You Wanted to be an early adopter. No, you wanted to buy the soft, the machine to play it. Simple as that. You're not early adopter. You didn't buy a new spaceship. You bought a PlayStation. <laughs> In order to like, continue your trek to space, you must get yourself. You're not getting a new technology. You're buying a machine to play games. You're like you're not. 
using vegetable oil cars. Stop, stop complaining. You, you want a yeah. PS 4.5? Go get a PS 4.5. <laughs> you knew it was going to happen. Stop being a big baby. But no, about you it. didn't because that trend has never existed in console gaming with that exception of the N64. It has, man. S Sega CD. Sega CD, man. Yeah, and look how Sega CD did. Yeah. <laughs> and then you bought the next Sega. I think the days of this eight or 10 year run for a console, because that's what the 360 and the PS4 were, or PS3 were, I think they're done, they're gone. You're gonna see a new evolution of console every four to five years. So during that four to five year period, you gotta be prepared for machine um, transformations. And I, yeah. Y you wanna know what I, I find myself more mixed on with the subject here is if I like I'm not a huge huge gamer as you know and when I get a console it's usually a couple of years behind and whatnot there's two sides of the coin here we could end up with the sort of phone model where okay now I can get into gaming with the previous generation for a more affordable price but then on the flip side the way it is now, I find myself conflicted because if I just wait a couple years, I get in on the current generation for a discounted price, right? So it's kind of a trade-off, but I think to me, as somebody who like might buy a PlayStation 4 this year or, or something like that, and then maybe in a few years buy an Xbox, I like the idea of in a few years from now, when, when I did make that purchase, if we were through this sort of uh, phone type model... I might end up being able to get myself a better machine than I would if I went and bought right now or just waited a few years under the current structure. So I think it's interesting. Um, and I think that there would be a lot of butthurt people if we go this way. I really do because Chris is right. A lot of people bought their machines not knowing that this is the way that it could go. But I tend to think that that's the better route when it all boils down. Well, and one final caveat, it could be a little bit of premature nerd rage because it is not a, they have not confirmed any of this is happening. This is being floated out there to different developers and it has been approached as a possible idea, but we know how those things work. They're going to float it out there to get the public reaction. They're going to let everyone cry for a little bit and exactly. then they're going to sneak it in. They're going to see how many people get offended and, and how much outcry it makes. It's, it's, it's actually pretty smart. It's a, it's a nice way. And then they can say, well, we never said anything about that. We, that, that, that was just a rumor. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, by point. the way, we're releasing a PlayStation Five. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Screw the four point five. It's the five. <laughs> I can't wait until that my Mass Effect games can be played on the Xbox One because yeah, I'll be playing. It's gonna that. be the one point five by then. Get a computer, man. You, you get a computer. You can play all those games. I know. Same I've pro. got all of them on both PlayStation and Xbox. I, I just yeah, after they started saying we're gonna change it up i was like okay i'll wait mm -hmm. let's face it i'm not gaming all that much right now anyway but i will tell you the ps3s are fantastic netflix streaming devices just say it i actually i actually totally disagree with that statement sp and i'll tell you the reason why i disagree with it because every damn time you want to use netflix <laughs> you have to update your stupid playstation the apple tv2 yeah, is right. actually a far better netflix device in my opinion well, I got a couple of those, too. <laughs> I, only, I only got my PS3 for two things. Well, I got it for one because it was a cheap Blu-ray at the time. I've only cheap. used it for that. And, yeah, it was cheap. At the time, it was cheap. At the time, it at was the, the cheapest Blu-ray player out there. And updatable, right. too. Updatable, too. Exactly. And the only game I've played on it was Mortal Kombat. <laughs> That's all. I, I think... <laughs> The only thing I've really played, aside from some super cheap games that I got along the way, that I was just like, yeah, let's see what these are. Uh, the only ha reasonable game was like Battlefield 4, was it? I don't know, whatever it was, but yeah. Um, I, I, though, I think Suncast has a really, really good point that summarizes it all and why this would be possibly be considered. And he goes, consider the life cycle of PC tech. It moves much quicker than consoles. And that kind of gets back to my point that I was getting at where um, a lot of times you will get a brand new game out that is like, let's let's took a look at a game that came out a, a couple years ago at the end of the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 life cycles. If it came out on the computer, looked amazing. When you went and you looked at its 360 or PlayStation 3 counterparts, it looked horrific. So, um, oh, well, that's not fair because they always look better on the PC. 
I know, but I'm saying it's just the level of graphics. So that might be where you start to see this, where, yes, you have the the 1.5 or the three, the 4.5. You got good graphics. You got the four. You got the crappy graphics. So it'd be interesting to see. And uh, JS, I think I think to summarize, you hit it on the head. Uh, they can get away with this because now they know it wasn't me. Yeah. Wasn't me. Yeah, and and and, and honestly, in honest, honest, honesty, I think what's going to happen is the um, four point five. If they do it, the games won't change. The four point five will just they'll have settings in the game to up the graphics, like a computer, but it'll be preset, so it'll detect that you have a four point five and put it at four K. And if that's the case, that's all right. But if you have that slippery, sl- slippery slope, rather, like you saw with the N64, where it's eventually, you can't play this game unless you upgrade, that's BS. Yeah, sure. but I, I, I think the one last thing that I, I want to throw in here is that the architecture is much different now for a console than it was back then. It is much more basically a, a piece a computer right versus computer. what it used to be which is why i think this sliding scale of graphics could actually be what happens and a lot easier to happen than back then so well let's, let's just go ahead anyway, and we're, we're, we're pretty much arguing about something that just might not even be true 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 let's talk about ghostbusters now <laughs> well let's just go <laughs> ahead and move into our next segment shall we do that if we have to all righty froze over this past weekend because Chris and SP managed to get together each other to with each other and discover that they don't wear boxers when they debriefed. Oh, wait, no, that's not what that is. Sorry. We are doing the C2E2 debrief right now. I misunderstood. My apologies. Right. And Chris got a hug for me. (laughs) Oh, la la. All right, so what happened was, as we've been plugging forever, the C2E2 podcast panel event was indeed this weekend. And you guys, first off, everybody who participated in that, you guys, kudos, knocked it out of the park. Uh, JS commented on our dollar earlier. I cannot attend because our dollar is that crappy. But I, I was I was sad to be missing it. And then... When I, I really saw it, I was like heartbroken. So yeah, I was you, pretty jealous too. You guys then, really I, did a great job. I was jealous. And then when the girlfriend said, well, you should have went. Like, oh, oh, no. Oh, no. Right oh. I, was, I, was oh. I was like, oh, look, they're so cool. They're on the radio. She's like, why didn't you go? I was like. <laughs> <laughs> And we were also on the front page of Bleeding Cool, too. Yeah. So you guys did a really good job. And we just want to take a few minutes here to talk a little bit about what you did. Let's back it up to Friday when you all first met, which was indeed the podcasting panel called Everyday Podcasting for Your Everyday Life. Yeah. And this Hall McCormick Place in Chicago, the convention center, they it, it's a pretty big place. They actually had three different events going on at the same time on Friday. It's not as big as San Diego Comic Con or the San Diego Convention Center, but it is pretty dang big. So meeting actually took a little bit because even though we all converged at the same time, we parked in three very different places that took, I don't know, about a half an hour to get from one to the other. So yeah, we met up and we game plan for the day. Uh, Meeting everybody was awesome. It was the first time I met Chris. It was the first time I met Naki in person. It was the fir- first time anybody had met Willie. I mean, and it was definitely <laughs> the first time that people had met Cody. Now, I had known Beef for years before, and but uh, everybody else, it was the first time they met Beef, and that was awesome. So we got together, Chris, and we game planned, and then we got the stuff out of my car, and uh, we got to the room, and well, before that, Chris, what did I find on the app? Let's talk about that. Oh, so the app kind of has some Big Brother-esque effects to it because you can go on the app and people can like panels. They're interested in things like that. So you can go and see how many people are interested in a certain panel. And we're sitting there in the convention hall and we've been wandering around and SP goes, 
I should look and see what that number is. And I kind of laughed internally and went, oh, I'll be, well, I'll be happy if maybe like 10 or 15 people have marked that they're interested in this. And I cannot remember, but all I remember is SP scrolling through and then I hear him kind of go, oh, what? And I look over and I go, what's that number at SP? And I cannot remember for the life of me what it was when we first looked at it. But I remember just being in complete disbelief. I think it was like 203. Like it was like <laughs> 200 people had marked it as interested. Uh, the, what I saw when I first opened it up was 107, but oh, yeah, okay, sorry, I, I, it was 107. I, I added a, an extra hundred. My bad. No, you're right. It was yeah, 107. Right. So, so, so yeah, that was pretty cool. Um, and then I think we got more people that were at the panel. Some people cycled in and out because there's multiple tool, multiple things going on when, during the panel, but I was thinking, okay, so a hundred people said, okay, we're interested in this, whatever I thought. Yeah. People blow off panels all the time in cons because they get suckered into the con floor. They get suckered into lines for uh, autographs or whatever. So I'm like, yeah, maybe half, maybe a quarter of those people show up. So when we actually get the stuff and we get outside of the room, Chris, what did we see? So we're getting set up and we're pulling out all the freebies and we're talking about what we're going to do. And then I can't remember, it was either myself or someone else. We look over and someone goes, is that people lining up to go in the room? And I kid you not, guys, there is a there is a line queuing up outside of the room we are supposed to be doing our panel in that starts winding its way around the corner. And that's when you can kind of see everyone go, oh, holy crap, this is real. <laughs> People are actually coming to this and you can kind of see that realization come across everyone's faces. And I got a text from everybody saying we should have prepared. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, Beef and I looked at each other and we're like, dude, we got this. We've done this before. It, it, and we've done it before on a micro scale with another network that we both were a, kind of a, a peripheral part of or a community that we are a part of. So we kind of were prepared in that manner, but none of us, Beef or I, had not been behind the podium, had not been behind a, a con panel table before or anything, so it was new to everybody, and we get in there, we have 15 minutes to set up, and this is not something like they have people there for you. You have the room for 15 minutes before the panel, you get to set up and then you have the panel and then right after the panel, you have to get out and there's nobody there to help you. So you have to use what they have available to you and you have to, whatever you bring, whatever you do, you have to do on your own. So all our giveaways, which I'll, I'll show, you guys mind if I show what we gave away? Yes, we yeah, do. Go for it. We do, we okay. do, no, we do mind. Okay. No, I'm just kidding. So go ahead. Uh, go, no, I'm kidding. So for, go the, ahead. For, the, for the audio listener, what I'm doing is I'm holding up a coaster and it's an etched coaster, an embossed or debossed coaster with the Gunna Geek logo on. Now, why were we giving this away? We never actually said so on the panel. It's because <laughs> when you podcast, you're drinking, right? And I'm just going to demonstrate this right now. Hopefully that my gate will. Yeah. Steven is doing that right now. So, but if you put your cup down on a leather coaster, a padded coaster, it's not going to make any sound. So that is why we were giving them away. And it was really to help everybody with noise abatement. So we um, barely had enough to cover the room. And uh, we thought we were buying way more. We were like, maybe we could sell them online afterwards. Maybe we can give them away as freebies or something like that. Nope. All I have left is what's in my hand right now. About five or six of them. That's it. So should make sure that people get mechanical keyboards. <laughs> yes, <that was> right. <laughs> oh, <helpful. laughs> I was going to go down to the surplus store, get a lot of good mechanical keyboards and give those out to you. Yep. Uh, but we, we had to do all that. And then uh, Naki had been preparing and this is important. Naki actually prepared. We all prepared actually what we we're going to say. We, we agreed on the content that we were going to go around and everything, but Naki prepared and she moderated and it was a panel of six of us. Naki did extremely well, didn't she, Chris? Oh, she did. At first, you could tell she was a little uh, frazzled by the crowd for about the first two minutes. And then she just kind of was like, oh, yeah, this is like doing a podcast and kind of <laughs> just went from there. And that all went out the window. And you could kind of see at the same time, everyone started looking down the road at each other. And we're all like, we got this. Yeah, we're good. We know what we're doing. But that, that first two minutes, I fully admit, when I got in there and sat down and looked out across the room, I was like, damn. 
This is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> but what the what the audience doesn't know here, or listener doesn't know, is that you guys were so kind to send video fairly quick and audio fairly quick so that I could start putting clips online. So I, I've seen 70% of it and listened to the whole thing multiple times. And you guys really did knock it out. And yeah, you're right, Chris. Like uh you could see when the when you guys got in the groove. And it was just like game on and you guys really destroyed it and uh, lots of great feedback. We got lots of interaction online. I understand at the event, uh, I can tell you that Facebook likes have been up. Twitter follows have been up. Uh, so really cool. And you guys really did a wonderful job with that. And if you want to see that panel, we will end up putting it up in its entirety. Once we get a chance to kind of um, cut through some of the angles and, and whatnot and put it together, I'll be honest, audio is not going to be that great. However, uh, it will be something that you'll, it'll be quite watchable and you'll be able to see it online. Uh, hopefully it, it, about a week or so, uh, but we will get it up and we will post all about it. But moving on from that, you guys had another highlight, which also will hit the website in the next couple of weeks. Uh, Chris, why don't you feel this one? So if you guys aren't familiar, Cody, or one of our hosts over at uh, Game Life Balance US, who is also Twitter verified Cody, you might have heard us refer to him. He works at WGN Radio in Chicago as one of his jobs, one of his gigs. It's kind of a hobby gig, as he's put it, but he works there. So he was able to on Saturday. Yeah, Saturday. Sorry, I couldn't remember the day all of a sudden. They all blurred together. But on Saturday, he was able to use his connections, basically, to get all of us into one of WGN Radio's radio studios. Hold on. And wait, we before sat- you continue, do you want to say Saturday or do you want to say Sunday? Because the mics went missing on Saturday, right? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's true. They probably did. So, so he got us all up onto the seventh floor, I believe it was, of WGN Radio, put us in one of their studios. And everyone that was there, plus some friends of ours that friends of the network, such as Suncast and Michelle, who's been on ATGN before, we all sat down around the table and we did a podcast basically talking about our impressions of C2E2, how we thought the panel went. And we all were kind of just geeking out by the fact that we're in a radio studio. And I think the most ridiculous thing I was geeking out over is that right in front of my microphone was a cough button. And I was like, this is just awesome. I don't know why it is. I guess I'm a podcast nerd, but I was like, this cough button is the greatest thing ever to me. I mean, I have one that I can basically use on my own sound soundboard on my own mixer but having it built there in a studio environment just tickled me pink for some reason that's cool very cool and and th- once again this year because i had to go away at the beginning of the week uh i've only i've listened to about 70 percent of this and you guys were a great crew it was amazing all so many people in one room could could just play off of each other so well and it will this will be something that we will actually put on the gonna geek.com podcast feed when it does come out and, and you'll find it sprinkled across the network i'm sure when it does does come out but uh you guys did a really good job with that and sounded like a lot of fun and uh i know you mentioned michelle ely she actually was also a writer for gonna geek back in the day that's true i mean and i think part of the reason why the saturday cast went so well is we were pretty much riding a high starting at about 3 45 p.m after our panel in that panel room everyone's like Oh, wow. We just did so good. That was so much fun. We had a full room and it just carried over to the podcast we did up at WGN radio the next day. So we were just riding high on a cloud of victory. (laughs) Yeah. One of one of the great reasons it was a success is we had people that had uh, a lot of experience, uh, minimal experience. So a wide variety of experience and a wide variety of of dedicated interests. Like Cody was up there talking about social media. I was talking about gear a little bit, talking about live production. Chris was up there talking about that. So we had uh, the con- when you when this comes out, go if you're interested in podcasting, go ahead and listen to it. It is akin to basically an episode of Better Podcasting, a live episode of Better Podcasting in front of people with real questions, real issues, and we were able to address, I believe, all of it in in most uh, uh, t- a satisfaction to uh, the questions that came up. So it it was th- that is really why it was so great. It was because the interaction and the content of the actual panel were it, it was just amazing. So once that comes out, go check it out and you'll find out what we're talking about. And before we move off the topic, I know Suncast is watching live right now. Big thank you to Suncast who has taken photos and stuff while we were doing the panel. There are probably some of the best pictures we have of what was going on during the panel because since we were all up there, we couldn't really take our own pictures. There's some video stills and stuff I'm sure we could pull out, but Suncast got some great photos for us of the panel itself. I'm so glad that you were able to meet up with Suncast and yeah, Suncast 
Uh, we will talk after because those photos are amazing. And I, I hope to put some of them maybe on Gunna Geek or something like that. But yeah, you did a did an amazing job. Um, and Suncast, thank you for being a part of that podcast as well. It was great to see your voice on there and uh, see his voice. You saw the waveform. You're like, that's Suncast. <laughs> I did. I did. I did. No, I didn't. But uh, I, I saw the video. There you go. There you go. Yeah. But great job to everybody involved. And I want to give a special, special shout out because she hates whenever I've done this, any of the hundred places that I've done it this past weekend, this was all Naki's idea. She was the one that thought of it, came to the group, posted the idea, got a rolling, put in the paperwork, came to us celebrating and dancing when we got accepted and ended up uh, then getting everybody connected in order to start the official planning. So it was indeed Naki's idea. So Naki special credit to you on that as well. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Naki. But that is indeed taking us to the end of the show. Before we do wrap up, I will go around the table and give everybody a moment here to plug what they would like to plug. Let's start off with Stargate Pioneer, because I know it's been like a week or two since you've had a chance to plug on a podcast. I know you've been plugged on many podcasts, but go ahead. Oh, 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 that sounded so wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I can uh, recover from that. I, I feel a little wounded. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing you want to plug? Yeah, just the Get a Geek Network. It is an amazing group of people. And when these podcasts come out from the uh, C2E2 event, it, go listen to them. They're, they're going to be a lot of fun. And uh, we enjoyed doing them. So thank you very much also to everybody that came to the panel. If you're listening to this, we really appreciate you showing up. That just floored every one of us. So thank you very much. Yes. And the checks are in the mail. No, they're not. No, <laughs> no. We, I'm stiffing you on that. No. I'm Wait, they get checks and we don't? <laughs> They got coasters. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. Someone's getting a stiffy. Hey, you know what, though? You guys had some amazing business card to hand out to all the ladies. Yeah, ladies yeah, we dig did. podcasters. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks to our network owner. Thank you for uh, making that, that is true. Uh, happen. Thank you. T-shirts were nice, too. Yeah, yeah. That was yeah. the beef's idea, wasn't it? Yeah, credit to beef. He got beef. those T-shirts printed up real fast for us to have at the uh, convention. And it was great to have everyone up at the front of the room wearing a good geek T-shirt. Cool. JS, you got anything you want to promote? Nope, well, nope, nope, nope. Everything's cool. And how about you, Chris? I know that you did not you do your all things good nerdy the other day, so you're probably sitting here wanting to talk about bacon or something or another. We'll go something or other. That's what I was going to go with. So I will tweet it out here in a little bit, but if you guys want a taste of what the C2E2 experience was for us, Suncast has put together a vlog of his experience, which has a lot of the Gunna Geek podcasters uh, crashing his video at different times or pictures that include some of us and some of the awesome cosplay there. So I will tweet that out later this evening, his vlog from C2E2. It's seven minutes of awesomeness just seeing all the cool stuff we ran into. Awesome, and I am going to go ahead and promote the entire GunnaGeek.com network. Seriously, this wouldn't have happened without the amazing people part of the network. So, for episode 138 of the GunnaGeek.com podcast, I sincerely tip my hat to everybody involved with the panel. I'm excited that panel went as well as it did. I'm looking forward to any future panel that we decide to do. Yeah, I'm definitely not missing any next ones. How about like curtain panels? Would you do that? Bye. Anything. Bye, guys. From everyone here at the GunnaGeek.com podcast, thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, please give us a five star review on iTunes. We encourage you to send your feedback by email to podcast at gunnageek.com. You can find all of our show history at gunnageek.com slash official podcast. And while you're there, why not head over and check out all of the geeky podcasts on the Gunna Geek Network. The music heard on this show is by Kevin McLeod of incompetech.com. Thanks for listening, and we will see you again next week. <laughs>